When I say German occupation of Ukraine, you most likely will think about the Second World War when the German armies attacked the Soviet Union, Ukraine back then was a part of. This was not the first time the German armies had been here because during the First World War, they also took control over the Ukrainian lands. And this happened in 1918. How it started, how it ended is what you will learn today. Welcome back regular viewers. If you are new, my name is Stefan. I'm a Dutch history teacher and I like to cover history for you. If you find it interesting, please consider subscribing and also hit that notification bell. Now, first and foremost, when I say German occupation, what I actually mean is German and Austro-Hungarian occupation to be more precisely, but the Germans did have the upper hand. Now, normally I cover these occupation videos on location, but at the time it's not possible. And, you know, to be fair, I guess there's no traces left of the short-lived 1918 German occupation. So you have to do with some footage that I recorded in my past travels. Now, not many details of this short-lived occupation are known to the general public. Reasons for this is that it was a short-lived occupation. But also, it got overshadowed by larger events that followed shortly after the Ukrainian War of Independence, the Russian Civil War, and later Stalin's rule, and of course, the Second World War. Now, to understand how the Central Powers came in possession of Ukraine, we need to discuss the treaty that made this possible. And that was the Treaty of brest litovsk that was signed on the 3rd of March, 1918. When, after the October Revolution in 1917, the Bolsheviks had seized power in Petrograd and Moscow, they asked for an armistice with the Central Powers. Soon, negotiations began. Now, Ukrainian nationalists asserted independence on the 12th of January, 1918. And when, near the end of that month, the talks between the Germans and the Soviet delegation deadlocked, the Ukrainians signed a separate peace deal with the Central Powers, a so-called bread peace, in which Ukraine agreed to supply Germany and Austro-Hungary with a million tons of bread annually in exchange for their recognition of the Ukrainian People's Republic, the UNR, that had recently declared its independence from Russia. Eventually, the Bolsheviks did sign the treaty with the Central Powers, and this happened on the 3rd of March 1918 and was known as the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. The Germans gained control over huge swaths of land, among which the whole of Ukraine. A week after the Bread Peace was signed, the Ukrainian Rada had, was chased away from the capital Kyiv because the Bolsheviks took over power. Now, and they made an appeal to the Germans to help them. After the 3rd of March, the Bolsheviks had agreed to move out. Now, the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, they moved in. And by the 8th of May 1918, they managed to reach their furthest point, which was Rostov on Don. Now, from what I understand is that the Germans did not encounter much resistance when they moved in, only locally. But this resistance would soon increase. I'll get to that later. The Germans brought in 16 infantry divisions, most of them third-rate troops. All in all, I read that the Austrians and Germans had around 600,000 troops in the region. Now, let's discuss the political side, because the Germans and the Ukrainian Rada definitely were not on the same page, as historian Laura Engelstein wrote. The Rada had abolished private property and land, though without endorsing the peasant seizures already transforming the countryside. The Germans now imposed martial law, assumed control of the railroads, restored private land ownership, and tried more energetically to extract the grain the Rada had failed to wrest from the peasants. See, according to the treaty, the Ukrainians had to give the Central Powers 1 million tons of grain per year. Now, initially, the Germans worked together with the Ukrainian Rada. However, the Rada failed to meet the quotum. German General Hoffmann acknowledged from the beginning that the Ukrainian Rada was kept in peace because of the German presence. German General Wilhelm Gruner wrote to General Ludendorff the following. Our policy is to walk on eggshells around the Ukrainian government, which has not earned this name and has no roots in the people. The attitude of the population is generally against us. In favor of us are the large landholders and capitalists if we help them to recover their property. Otherwise, they too will be against us. 
The German military governor of Ukraine became General Field Marshal Hermann von Eichhorn, who ordered to force the peasants to sow the fields. The Germans were impatient, and so were the large landowners. And at the end of April, with German backing, they seized power in Kyiv. The coup engineered by the Germans brought to power the government of General Pavlo Skoropadsky, a descendant of an 18th century Cossack hetman, deeply conservative in his views, who represented the interests of Ukraine's landowning class. He declared himself hetman of the new state, appealing to the historical memory of the masses. In tradition of the hetmans of old, he ruled as a dictator, his power limited only by foreign authority the German and Austrian command. Now, Skoropadsky did manage to do some state building, taking steps to reorganize an army and creating a Ukrainian language school system, an academy of sciences and national library. 11 countries sent their ambassadors to Kyiv. But keep in mind, all this was backed by German guns. The Skoropadsky regime was highly unpopular with the workers who saw their working hours being increased to 12 hours and of course the peasants who had their grain confiscated. The German troops then went into the countryside themselves to get the grain from the peasants, who of course resisted. The Austrian and German troops then launched raids against them. John Xidias, a Russified Greek who lived in Odessa, claimed that the German and Austrian raids outdid the raids of the Tsarist times and had this to say about it. Thus, a detachment would arrive in a village on the instructions of the Pomishik, big landowner. A collective note was presented to the peasants, demanding the return of given quantities of livestock, tools, chattels, etc. The raid complete. The German or Austrian officer would pocket 10% to 20% of the value of the restored assets. It goes without saying that the German military educated to the most profound contempt for the Russian people were very appreciative of these sources of income and shrank from no measure, no matter how brutal likely to generate them. I read the peasants who resisted run the risk of being summarily executed. All a landowner had to do was point out an alleged culprit and that person would then be executed after a show trial or no trial at all. I read that during the months of German occupation, 80,000 Ukrainian peasants perished. To what extent the peasants died of execution or perished in armed resistance against the central powers, I wasn't to figure out exactly. What is clear is that armed resistance occurred and it already started in the early days of the Rada when the Rada tried to confiscate the grain, as historian Orlando Fages puts it. The result was a wave of peasant revolts and guerrilla wars designed to disrupt the German requisitions. Bridges and railway lines were destroyed and German units were attacked from the woods. The Ukrainian countryside was thrown into chaos. Most resistance came from the left socialist revolutionaries. On the 30th of July, a young Russian left SR assassinated the German governor of Ukrainian Kyiv, Eichhorn. As the field marshal was crossing the street on his way back after lunch, Boris Donskoy threw a hand grenade at him. Eichhorn died of his wounds that evening. The perpetrator was sentenced to death by hanging. I read that by the end of the summer, most of the workers were on strike and 40,000 peasants managed to join armed insurgents groups. One of these groups were the followers of Nestor Magno. I did dedicate a video on his movement, see the link in the top right corner and at the end screen. At the end, the economic gains of the occupation were little and the costs were high. The Germans could transfer 33 divisions from the east to the west for the upcoming spring offensive. Germany's last gamble to win the war, which ultimately failed. As historian Brit Batar wrote, Had another 12 divisions been available in the West, the outcome of Germany's last gamble to secure victory might have been different. If Germany prevailed in the West, its armies would be free to rewrite the map of Europe in any manner that they chose. But defeat in the West ultimately made any settlement in the East irrelevant. It is arguable, therefore, that Greece and a hasty desire to impose as harsh terms as possible on the Bolsheviks effectively eliminate Germany's last chance to win the war. On the 11th of November 1918, the armistice 
was signed. The terms annulled the terms that were set in the Brest-Litovsk peace treaty. Therefore, the Germans had to pull back from Ukraine. Most German units managed to successfully escape from Ukraine, but not all units were that lucky. Some of them ran into armed partisans who wanted to avenge the harsh occupation. In some cases, German convoys had to battle their way out. When unsuccessful, often officers were shot, while rank and file soldiers were allowed to go free. Their weaponry was confiscated and used by the insurgents for battles to come. I read that the number of 50,000 of Austro-Hungarians and Germans joined the Red Army. A smaller number joined Nestor Machno's movement. Thanks to my patrons, you see their names on the screen right now. And a special thanks to Thomas Zabiega, Damien Wallace, Connor, Philip Jordan, Marcus Kaas, Nick Terranova, Haley, Mark Little Hale, Janusz Jorzenkiewicz, Joan, Jester Tabel, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Susanna Di Bella, John Beach, Fabrizio, Way Back History, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, Luis Pichera, and Mike West. If you want to learn more about the movement of Nestor Magno, you can click right here. And if you're interested in what happened to Ukraine after the short-lived German occupation was over, I dedicated a video on that. You can find it right here. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and auf Wiedersehen.